Welcome everybody, thank you for tuning in. Today, we're gonna to be reviewing the Orbea Rise H10. The same Orbea Rise RS philosophy, but in a slightly more affordable, larger battery, aluminum chassis. So a few months back, we tested the Orbea Rise Carbon, had a lot of good experience and time on that bike. So we were really excited to put a lot of test miles on the H version. Uh, this bike is a 150, 140 millimeter 29er. It is in that e-bike light category and uh, what we consider e-bike light are basically e-bikes that have less than full power out of the drive units. Now what's different about the Rise and Rise H is that they don't actually have a smaller or different drive unit like others, say like the Specialized Levo SL uh, or some others do. They have the same Shimano EP8 drive unit, however it is detuned to this RS philosophy. And basically what that means is it tunes power down to 60 Newton meters of power as a max output and the reason for that is to um, sort of extend the battery range and the mileage you can get out of this bike because obviously um, part of having these lighter e-bike light category bikes is a lighter on trail feel so that usually means a smaller battery now what i like about the rise h versus carbon is well one it's alloy and i'm a big fan of how aluminum bikes feel on the trail but i also really like the fact that it has a larger inboard battery than the carbon version. So the alloy frame has a 540 watt hour internal battery, whereas the carbon model has a 360 watt hour battery. There is a 252 watt hour extender uh, bottle battery that you can mount. Um, it is sold separately, but if you want to get some max mileage, that is certainly something worth considering. Similar to other EP8 models, it does have two rider profiles which are customizable. Uh, within your Shimano eTube app. So Rider 1 out of the factory uh, setting will have a little bit more of a uh, softer, more natural feel, um, a little less aggressive assist and, and power delivery, whereas Profile 2 will be kind of a snappier, peppier, um, I don't wanna say artificial, but like a, a stronger, more deliberate boost uh, feeling. Once again, though, that can easily be customized in that app. It's very easy to do and something that uh, we, we suggest playing with no matter what type of bike you have because it really makes a difference on your terrain and, and the type of ride you want. Orbea offers three levels of the Rise H with prices starting at $56.99, going all the way up to $79.99 for the H10 we have here on review. Obviously, uh, Prices are subject to change and have been changing a lot in the last year and a half. So uh, at, at least at this time, you're looking at $8,000 for this H10 model. Now, once we get into evaluating the value equation, there is a lot of room for personal preference. Some riders might value a higher end suspension with a lower end wheel and drivetrain, whereas some might want really nice brakes and very good wheels and will take a lower tier suspension. So. Um, you know, that's a topic that's really tough for us to say it's good or bad in value because what might be a good value for us might not be for you. But that being said, I think compared to what's on the market and, you know, what prices are these days, you're getting full factory Kashima suspension, you're getting Shimano XT drivetrain, XT brakes, race face turbine R wheel set, um, and some E13 crank. So it's you know, it's roughly the going price. I wouldn't say that it's an amazingly screaming deal. I also wouldn't say that it's outrageously overpriced by any means. That doesn't mean there aren't things that we would change or wish were done differently in the spec selection. Uh, we will get into those now. So uh, it, again, it's a 150, 140 bike. It's designed to be a trail bike. I would love to see a shock with a reservoir on here, even if it was moved down to a performance line shock. I would still opt for performance line shock with a reservoir rather than a factory Kashima level float DPX. Um, something else obviously up for debate is the 36 fork. 
at 150 millimeters of travel, is a 38 really necessary? No, but depending on your riding style um, and kind of what this bike is capable, I think a 38 wouldn't be out of the question for some riders. Um, brake selection is great. Drivetrain is great. We're huge fans of XT stuff. I do think possibly changing the wheel spec could be, uh, you know, something that some heavier or super aggressive riders might want to consider. But I think the tire spec is definitely something a lot of riders are going to want to evaluate. It has a XOXO Plus casing. As you can see, we are not running those. Uh, we very quickly flatted and put holes in those. So I think, you know, even though it's a lightweight e-bike, the, the fact that it is still a heavier bike and you are able to get more downhill time and more downhill runs means you should just have a burly or heavier duty tire. Next up, let's discuss some of the geometry on this bike and then get into on-trail performance. We opted to test the size large Orbea Rise and the geometry is conservative in the trail category, I would say. Uh, it has a 474 millimeter reach, which I am totally fine with as that's right in my happy zone. It has a 76 and a half or 77 degree seat tube angle and a 66 or 65.5 degree head tube angle. The chain stays measure out at 445 millimeters. There is a 336 millimeter bottom bracket height and a 627 millimeter stack height. The overall wheelbase sits at 1,229 millimeters. So by no means is this bike long slack radically extreme uh, in any way. Something that's worth noting is that the larger sizes have 170 millimeter cranks and the medium and smalls have 165. Uh, I'm a big fan of shorter cranks, especially on e-bikes, so I'd love to see 165s and maybe even 160s on the smaller bikes. Moving on to the rest of the Geo, it is, it's well-rounded. Again, this bike is designed to be a trail bike and versatile in a lot of different terrain, so it's not supposed to be this big burly long travel enduro sled right it is a 140 150 29er so i think uh, for a lot of riders in a lot of terrain this shorter steeper slightly more playful geometry is going to actually reward you so let's get over to the trails and see how it actually performs oh people often ask why we like 165 cranks and this type of riding is exactly why So one of the things we love about the Orbea Rise is that although it has 60 newton meters of power, which is less than a full power bike, it's currently more than any other lightweight e-bike, which means we can keep up with riders on full power e-bikes a lot better and have a lot of fun getting in big miles on short time frames. and you've got the power to get up the steepest little pitches. All right, we know this is a trail bike, but we put, wouldn't put this type of trail outside the trail category. And it's why we think a reservoir shock and heavier duty tires are a good call. So when it comes time to evaluating the Rise H in terms of on-trail performance, I would say that overall, it is a pretty solid machine. I didn't notice too many great differences between the Rise H and the Carbon. Um, a couple of key points that I did notice were, it, it is a little bit heavier at uh, just about 46 pounds. You know, that, that couple extra pounds is noticeable when you're wanting to kind of, you know, pre-hop stuff, uh, really bunny hop tall things, but by no means is it a deal breaker in my opinion. If I was gonna be buying a Rise, I probably would be looking at the Rise H just from a value perspective. And again, I like the way Alloy rides. It would allow me to upgrade that shock with that little bit of extra savings and get myself a new set of tires. So in terms of where this bike excels, it is a 140, 150 millimeter trail bike. It excels on the trails. Uh, by that, I mean uphill, downhill, side hill, whatever it might be. Bikes that you would normally expect to perform well in that 140, 150, 29er realm, this bike excels. It is a powerful, 
more powerful than other SL bikes in the category. I really like that. I am a big fan of more power. Um, I think it just allows you to get up steeper terrain faster, get more laps done, more miles covered. And as someone you know who has a, a little baby at home and doesn't have a ton of free time anymore, being able to maximize miles and get a really good workout with the most benefit is something I'm really excited about. So, you know, if I've got an hour, hour and a half that I can go ride and I know I can get just as good of a workout, but get three or four downhills in instead of one, um, I'm all for that. And I think the, the lightweight e-bike category is one that is growing and will be growing more in the near months. Um, and I think it's something that's gonna be really exciting as battery tech gets better, drive units get better, and are able to put out more power. I, I'm really excited for where this thing goes. Um, but it'll also be really interesting to see how brands adapt. I know that a lot of Orbea Rise riders are putting longer shocks on these bikes and increasing the travel front and rear, putting 38s up front and going 160, 160. We talked to Orbea about that. They definitely do not condone or support that activity. And without getting too much into why that is, uh, I will just say this bike was not intended to be a 160, 160 bike, and uh, we'll move on from there. Would I love it if it was? Absolutely. Um, I'd even be happy if it was a 150, 160 bike, but who knows, possibly in the future, um, Orbea will add a slightly longer travel, more aggressive, lightweight e-bike to their uh, lineup. but. Uh, time will only tell there. Who do I think this bike is for? I would say that it's gonna be, boy, it's a pretty broad range of riders, to be honest. I think your general riding public that maybe doesn't want to go to a full 50 plus pound e-bike, doesn't want big bulky down tube, doesn't want 90 Newton meters of torque and more. They want uh, something that looks a little more traditional, something that feels and rides a little bit more traditional. This is gonna be a really good option. Um, I think that riders who are maybe not in super aggressive terrain, you know, obviously you've got a little bit steeper head tube angle. I probably would put a 160 fork on this thing, um, probably but even go with a 38 here, and, and it would slack would. in that head tube by about half maybe a degree, give a little more confidence. And I would also put a rear shock on with the reservoir. And from that, I'd honestly call this thing pretty good. But again, I'm probably on the upper end of the intended rider terrain that this bike is designed for. I think more often than not, the majority of riders who are gonna be riding XC, you know, bike path, trail to aggressive trail riding are gonna really enjoy how this bike performs. Volume reducer is probably gonna be needed for heavier riders. I'm only about, what well, I weigh about 175 pounds and I'm running 215 or so PSI in this rear shock uh, and still getting through all that travel on kind of larger landings. Um, and the downside to that is I'm compromising some of that small bump sensitivity, which I'm a big fan of. So volume reducers again, or a little bigger volume shock would help. I love that there's more power than other SL bikes on the market. Um, it is noisy. And I know a lot of people complain about the EP8 rattle. It's there, um, but I'm also noticing some rattling up in the down tube. Um, and I think it could be the cables that are rattling. I'm only noticing it um, on slower, chunkier descents. If I'm, if I'm pinning it and I'm riding hard and fast, it sort of, fades into the background and it's not something I'm noticing. However, it's if it's like kind of a low grade descent and you're just kind of, you know, plunking along down the trail casually, that's when you can really notice that rattle. Um, it is it is a little bit of a nuisance, I will say. And like I said, it's more than just that EP8 rattle. I think it is cable noise. So moving on to the performance of the rest of the kit, I'm big fan of the XT brakes. The Galfer rotors work quite well. I know the, the Turbine R wheel set was something we were a little bit hesitant on, on the carbon rise. Same goes here. Um, you know, it, with a bigger, burlier casing tire, it does help. But I do think if you're someone who's either heavy or regularly riding in trails with big compressions, like I'm talking big berms or landings, uh, you know, you, you may want to look into a slightly burlier 
wheel set, the Orbea My O program allows you to customize paint to some spec changes. So that is really cool. So ultimately guys, I really do believe that this is a very well-rounded and capable all around lightweight trail e-bike. Um, again, it's not designed or intended to be an enduro bike. Um, you know, there are other options on the market that have 160 mil of travel or more. This is a 150, 140, 29er. It's built to be that. So uh, don't go and expect this thing to be your enduro rig or your self shuttle downhill rig. It's not. Um, it is a playful, lively trail e-bike. And for that reason, I really do think that a great majority of riders are gonna have a lot more fun on this than some of the super long, super slack, um, long-legged enduro bikes that you know they may not actually need for their terrain. It's fun to climb. It is you know sprightly, lively, getting up over you know rock ledges, techie bits. Very cool. That added sick power with that 60 newton meters makes it a goat to get up anything. Still lively and stable enough to kind of have fun on jump trails and still give you a little bit of confidence when it comes time to plowing over some rocks. So thank you all very much for watching the video. Hopefully you found that entertaining and got some good information. If you did, we would really appreciate you hitting that subscribe button. Um, the numbers don't lie and it seems like a lot of you watching this video right now are not subscribed to the channel. So do us a favor. We're out here sweating our butts off. Just hit the subscribe button. It would mean a lot to us. Thank you very much. And we'll see you out on the trails.